Coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. I think change starts from within. And for some people, that personal self-oriented motivation is going to be what gets them on this path. And then I think what ultimately will sustain the path is realizing the good for others and something that is larger than ourselves. Paradoxically, the best way we may grow as ourselves is to focus on others. And that is also how we sustain the growth option. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become Passion Struck. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 188 of Passion Struck, ranked as one of the top health and fitness podcasts. And thank you to each and every one of you who come back to the show to learn how to live better, be better, and impact the world. And if you're new to the show, thank you so much for being here, or you just want to introduce this to a friend or family member. We now have episode starter packs, both on the Passion Struck website as well as Spotify. These are collections of our fans' favorite episodes that we group into topics to give any new listener a great way to get acquainted to everything that we do here on the show. Just go to passionstruck.com slash starter packs to get started. In case you missed our interviews from last week, they featured Dr. Cassie Holmes, where we explore her new book, Happier Hour. Cassie is one of the foremost experts in the world on time and happiness. We also had on Jason Pfeiffer, who is the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine, and we explore his new book, Build for Tomorrow, How You Embrace Change and adapt quickly to future-proof your career. And lastly, we had on a special episode with Seth Godin, where we discuss the Carbon Almanac, and we go into why systems change is so needed to address this growing climate change that we're all facing. Please go check them all out if you haven't. And we would so appreciate a five-star rating or review. If you like today's episode or any of those others, they go such a long way in helping to promote this podcast, as well as its ranking on iTunes and Spotify. Now, let's talk about today's guest. Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman is a cognitive scientist and humanistic psychologist exploring the deaths of human potential. He is a professor at Columbia University and director of the Center for Human Potential. Dr. Kaufman has authored 10 books and is host of the Psychology Podcast. Dr. Jordan Feingold is a resident physician in psychiatry at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Well-being research researcher and positive psychology practitioner. Her research and clinical interests involve protecting and promoting healthcare workers as well as patient well-being and incorporating positive psychology into healthcare delivery. Scott and Jordan are co-authors of the brand new book, Choose Growth, which launches actually today. It is a workbook for transcending trauma, fear, and self-doubt. And in our discussion, we go into how Jordan and Scott initially met and how that encounter ended up changing Jordan's approach to medicine altogether. Scott discusses his popular Science of Living course at Columbia University. We go into what self-transcendence really is and why life is not a linear journey, but more like the path of a sailboat. We unpack the different elements of choosing growth as well as the lessons for how you do it. These include the importance of human connection, how to face fear, the power of exploration, and we end by discussing the keys to savoring life and so much more. Thank you for choosing Passion Struck and choosing me to be your host and guide on your journey to creating an intentional life. Now, let that journey begin. I am so ecstatic to welcome Scott Barry Kaufman and Jordan Feingold to the Passion Struck podcast. Welcome, Jordan and Scott. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us, John. Well, it's great to have you both here and congratulations on the launch of your new book. I can't wait to talk about it. I'm going to put it up right here. We'll put it in the show notes. Uh, we're also going to be covering Scott's book that I've got right here along with it. One of our first podcasts together, Jordan and I. So this is a special moment for us. Well, I feel very honored. So incredible to have you both on. 
Well, I understand that you both met at the University of Pennsylvania, where Scott, you at the time were teaching a course, and Jordan, you happened to be a senior. And I wanted to ask, Jordan, as you were sitting there, something moved you so much about what Scott was discussing and teaching you about human flourishing that it caused you to actually postpone your medical school application. Can you tell us a little bit more about that from both your perspectives? I had always known that I wanted to be a doctor and my vision was I loved the human body and I wanted to help people achieve a whole state of health. I didn't really know at the time that medicine was really more oriented about getting rid of disease and dysfunction and that which afflicts the human condition. So my senior year, I had some extra courses I could take and I had known about positive psychology because Penn happens to be the fertile ground where the field was founded. And I am sort of one of those people who came out the womb optimistic. And when I heard about the science of positive psychology, it kind of resonated with the way that I lived my life. I was like, oh, there's a science about how I sort of feel I exist in the world and came to class. And it was a three hour seminar that Scott, and he insisted we call him Scott, uh, SBK, which was very atypical for a Penn professor to go by their first name. You were always SBK, yeah. And he, Scott, you must've been in your mid thirties at the time. He was just this young down to earth, cool professor who sat at the front of the room for three hours on a Monday. And Mondays are notoriously not the best day of the week in college when you're coming back from the weekend. And it was just the most amazing experience. We were learning about human flourishing, talking about these incredible concepts. It's when I discovered that there was actually a field that was explicitly about well-being as opposed to just getting rid of illness. And I was so motivated. I, I'm sure I was at the edge of my seat. I hand wrote all my notes and I was just so struck that there was something here that I needed to pursue further before I would go and eventually be a doctor. I had this reckoning that I, I needed to do more than just cure disease and get rid of what's wrong with us. I really wanted to promote what was right with people. And Scott was my introduction in, in a formal way to the field. Well, great. And I'd love to hear your perspective on it, Scott. And what was it like seeing this student who was just glued to what you were talking about? Well, I think that's what professors live for, really. I mean, you want students like Jordan. You want students that, that want to figure out some way of applying that information in their life. I mean, that, I think it's why we all go into the teaching profession, quite frankly. So it's a very touching thing when you have a student who has such motivation, which is the topic of your podcast. Jordan was just so motivated to make a positive, to figure out how she can maximize the positive change she wants to make in the world. Okay. And Scott, maybe as a follow on to that, I know you teach a very popular course at the Columbia University called The Science mm -hmm. of Living Well. Can you talk about what that class is about? I'm impressed. You even know the name of the course. You're welcome to sit in, sit in on the class anytime. You're in New York, by the way. <laughs> the class is an introduction to the latest science of well-being, but in a different sort of way than a lot of classes. There are some classes that are on, on happiness that are great. Some of my friends and colleagues teach classes on happiness, but this class is a little bit different. Living well is something that uh, encompasses, well, obviously a lot more than happiness. It encompasses meaning. It encompasses self-actualization. I would say that probably the core thing that runs through the entire class is self-actualization and helping the students in their path towards wholeness and their path towards reaching their highest potentials. Students are so stressed out right now. There's so much anxiety going on. And I think so much of the anxiety is the pressure to perform as opposed to be. And uh, this class is, is a class on being. And so uh, it takes them a little bit of time to adjust, especially Ivy League <laughs> students. Yeah, you were so right. And I had your friend Susan Kane on the podcast um, oh. a while back. And we were talking about this effortless perfectionism. And I've seen it play out, especially with my daughter as she was going through high school. She just started at the University of Florida. But mm -hmm. it just seems like these kids have so much pressure on them, not only to get the best grades, but they have to do all these volunteer hours. And because she was in the medical magnet, she had to get an additional 100 hours for that. And then on top of that, the 
groups you need to be in, the societies you need to be in. And I think it only gets worse when they get into college. I mean, it doesn't stop there. A lot of people are affected by this beyond that. So, and I know this perfectionism is something that we'll address in your workbook as well as we get through this interview. I wanted to switch it to Jordan for a second. This podcast is one of the top five alternative podcasts on iTunes. And we talk about a lot of different things, medicine, functional medicine, reverse aging, how to speed up your metabolism, ketosis, all these different things. But I'm not sure I've ever heard of positive medicine before. Can you explain what that is and how it's different? Yeah, absolutely. And I love the podcast, by the way. The ideas of positive medicine encompass so much of these alternative and integrative modalities. And this really stemmed from my reckoning that in positive psychology, Marty Seligman, when he was president of the APA in the late 90s, early 2000s, basically said psychology is super fixated on what's wrong with us, on all of the mental illnesses that afflict human beings. We need to usher in an era where we study what's right with people. And I think in many conversations with Marty, one of the things he expressed to me and conveyed to me was that one of the areas he had the hardest time really making a dent in has been medicine and applying positive psychology and medicine. And I think that's large in part because doctors go through such a specific, rigorous, sometimes fairly brutal training. There are a lot of similarities, I think, between medical training and the military, which we can talk about, just in terms of the culture, the hierarchy, the rigor, sleeplessness. I don't think it's a conscious thing, but there's almost this intolerance of someone from psychology or another field coming in and saying, we have to focus on the positive or ha like, let's make some changes. So as someone who was going through medical school and planning to enter the field myself, I thought what an opportunity to help usher in an era of positivity in medicine akin to that which Marty started in the field of psychology now over 20 years ago. And when I was getting ready to write my thesis in my master's program, there's so many applications, possible applications of positive psychology in medicine. What I realized is that the clinicians, the healthcare workers themselves are experiencing, and even before COVID, this was back in 2015, 2016, such an epidemic or even a pandemic of burnout of mental illness and of suicide within our field. I was drawn to really saying positive medicine has to start with the healthcare worker and teaching and embracing principles of understanding the mind-body connection, relationships, the power of relationships in our work and what we do as social prescriptions for our patients and ourselves, engagement, vitality, really um, having the energy to do our day-to-day -day tasks with vigor get enough sleep. And I know you have a great episode on sleep that you posted recently. And nutrition, which is nearly absent from our traditional medical education, accomplishment, thinking about our success as physicians and as patients as, as a non-zero sum game, what you're referring to this perfectionist cycle, talk about undergrads. I think it's magnified. And you mentioned your daughter is in the medical track, but medical students are such high achievers, but we're often put in cultures where we're pitted against one another in order to get a select number of medical school positions and residency slots. And in, in positive medicine, in my courses, we encourage collaboration and breaking down this notion of success as a zero sum game, finally connecting with our meaning and purpose and extracting the positive emotions from what we do. So really using this model I call REVAMP, which is the acronym I, I just alluded to relationships, engagement, vitality, accomplishment, and positive emotions as a framework and a springboard to not just getting rid of what's wrong with us as healthcare workers and then transmitting that to patients, but to really building what's right with us and, and seeing ourselves and our patients as whole people. Okay, that's great. And the rest of this discussion is really gonna be on this backdrop of transcendence or your book, Scott Transcends. So um, a white paper that I really enjoyed reading that helped me understand this more was done by your friend, uh, David Yaden, with some just incredible people. I think he had Dave Vago, Jonathan Haidt, Andrew Newberg on this as well with them. But to baseline the audience, can you explain to them what transcendence really is and why it's so important? Wow. 
That's a really big question. <laughs> a lot of people have defined self-transcendence uh, throughout the ages in very, very different ways. Abraham Maslow, in an article, I think he calls the varieties of transcendence, he proposes like a 96 or something definition. There's very different ways you could think of it, and I, I'm curious what people conjure up uh, in their head when they think of the word transcendence who are listening to this podcast. David Gaydon and his colleagues did a real systematic review and found that two main components were across most of definition. So you could find some commonalities across most. One of the facets is a less of a focus on yourself. It's not necessarily that you lose yourself forever, <laughs> but that you temporarily lose yourself. You don't focus as much on your outward somehow in, in your consciousness. But also the second component is a connection with the world. So Andy Newberg, who's a neuroscientist, did a lot of work. On, I think he wrote the book, Your Brain on God. Uh, he proposed a unitary continuum. There's extent to which we feel connectedness to to the world and to even to the universe, to animals, to to nature. It can really go out and out and out. And it can actually go in and in and in. You can have a great connection to a book you're reading. That could be the flow experience or something you're creating. It can be that flow. But if you really zoom out and you, and you want like the ultimate of transcendence, we, we could start talking about mystical experiences, which very few people ever, ever have a mystical experience. But that's just oneness with the world. Although more and more people are having it now since psychedelics is hot right now and, and is in. There was a Michael Pollan uh, documentary on that. I think it's right now, it's, I think it's on Netflix. So more people are having mystical experiences than maybe ever have before in the history of humanity. Maybe the easiest experience people could have is the feeling of awe which probably happens more than some of the others, but it's these peak experiences that really make life what it is. And so I think it's such an important conversation. Now, Jordan, you guys open up this book and you talk about what the book is and what it isn't. And I was hoping you could kind of lay that framework down for the listeners. It's so interesting because we want to help readers create transcendence. And that does mean figuring out where the boundaries are between ourselves and the world and, and being self-focused enough that we can build self-awareness and live deliberately, but not being so self-focused that we are just so self-absorbed and only thinking about ourselves and not how we relate in the world. So I think it's really important that folks use this book not to bolster their own narcissistic self-image, which we very much lay out mm. in the self-esteem chapter, but really to experience oneness, to experience transcendence and contribute to the good of, of society. So we talk about this book. It's not just a manual of how to be your best or most ideal self. And it's not prescriptive. It's not a book of this is the version of yourself that you ought to work toward. Rather, it's really a guide to help us build insight and understand chapter by chapter, what are our basic human needs that Scott outlined in Transcend, the book that preceded Choose Growth, and that is the basis of our workbook. What are our basic needs? How have these needs been thwarted? And how might we begin to close the gaps between where we want to be and where we are currently? While we have a, a lot of prompts and questions to build insight and then challenges to go out in the world and actually do the thing, actually meet the need and practice dipping our toes in the water of meeting these needs. It's not a solo expedition, we say, to use the extended metaphor of the sailboat, which I'm sure we'll get into, but it's really something that we should use ourselves and engage with others, engage with a therapist or counselor, engage with a book club or a growth group where we can all go through the book and these practices and talk about it together. So we want people to use the book as a guide to meeting their own needs in community and ideally in an ongoing basis. It's not a one and done process as you make your way through the book. We actually say at the end of the book, okay, now it's time to go back to square one and start again. Okay, and I'm going to tackle the sailboat now, and I'm going to ask you each a question on it. The first, I'll send it over to Scott. And that is, I was doing my research on Maslow, and I'm sure this is the case with most people. We see the hierarchy of needs represented in this triangle, which, based on your research, was never Maslow's intent. In your book, you outlay this new metaphor for it. I was hoping you could just take us through what that is and the different layers of it. 
Yeah, it, well, it turns out Maslow never drew a pyramid. It was a bunch of management consultants in uh, writing a textbook in the in the 60s that tried to depict his theory of motivation. But they didn't really do a good reading of his theory, because if you really read the theory of motivation, you realize it's a really rich theory. It's not like life is a video game that you reach some level of needs, like the need for safety. And then some voice from above is like, congrats, you've unlocked connection. Then you can like move up some sort of Legend of Zelda sort of thing. It's very clear that that's not how Maslow thought about life. And a sa what a sailboat captures is the idea that we need to have an integrated whole as we move through this world. We're more than the sum of our parts. There's something that emerges that is Scott Barry Kaufman, whatever cheeky, <laughs> quirky being this is right now that's talking is an integrate is more than the sum of its parts. And the way that we integrate the various parts of ourselves is very important. The way that we address our safety needs in dialectical with our growth needs is very important. These things play off each other in very important ways. It is very, very important to have our safety needs met or then to feel a secure base of a sailboat, right? If you have too many holes in the sailboat, you're going to sink, <laughs> not <Yeah>. blow, <laughs> sink, sink. Uh, we don't want to sink as humans. We don't want to feel like we're sinking. It's very, very important to feel stable. But at the same time, humans strive for much more than just stability. We strive to open up our sail and and grow and to be our authentic selves, to be our, our most self-actualized selves, to move in the sense of direction and purpose. We want to be have agency with propelled by passion, propelled by authentic, intrinsic passion. So it, but all the part, that's the work of self-actualization. And I actually am creating uh, with Jordan, a new form of coaching called self-actualization coaching. I'm really excited about it. So that's like on my mind a lot these days. And a big part of that is really identifying, understanding all these different sides of yourself so that you can have really go in the direction you really want to go in, in your life. Yeah, that's great. I understand you guys have a course that you've built, you've got a quiz that you're doing as well. I can't wait to see the content myself. Thank you. If the listeners have never heard this before, and I'm not sure if you guys have, up until he was 35 years old, President Abraham Lincoln described himself as a piece of driftwood, an autopilot aimlessly being floated down the waterways. And I use that analogy because in some of the discussions I've had here on the podcast with notable behavioral scientists, Katie Milkman, Eilat Fishback, mm. Michelle Seeger, Cassie Holmes, they all bring up the importance of the power of choice. And it's something that the two of you discuss in the book as well. And I'll direct this to you, Jordan, but why do we as humans need to choose growth instead of living this autopilot life? This idea of choice is so critical and it's so critical that it is the title of our book, Choose Growth. And this comes from a quote by Abraham Maslow. I'm just going to read it so I, I don't misquote it. But it's, one can choose to go back toward safety or forward toward growth. Growth must be chosen again and again. Fear must be overcome again and again. And that is where the title of the book comes from. In my own psychiatry training and my training director, one of them, Asher Simon, always tells me we always have a choice. Human beings always have a choice. Everything we do. There are many things that we cannot choose. For example, our genetic makeup. We had no choice. We didn't choose to be alive. We didn't choose the families we were born into. We didn't choose the conditions of our births. There are so many things that we have no control over, yet that can't build an illusion that we are not in control of anything. And one of the, the goals of this book is to help people understand we often have more choices than we actually think we do. And mm -hmm. if we fall subject to a victim mentality or think the world is just happening to us, and I know this idea of being a victim is something Scott is incredibly excited about thinking through, and I'll leave that to him. If we choose to see ourselves in that way versus choosing to see ourselves as agentic beings who have a lot more control than we think, we can actually build our autonomy. We can start to di bolster our self-esteem. We can move in the directions of life that we want to go. Of course, with some limitations and these choices are not necessarily equitable across society. And we have to recognize the real structural barriers to making choices that are in line with our goals and how we may have to overcome different barriers to do so. But we always have a choice. 
And this book is really about helping people identify like what is in our control and what is not, and how do we really optimize that locus of control and, and live the life that is authentic to us and in line with our values. Yeah, there's, a, there's so much nuance there. <laughs> that, that wonderful job, Jordan. There's so much nuance there in the interaction we have with our environments and how it can affect how some choices can be harder to choose the growth option versus others. We're trying to think this through. Sometimes a really big part of the choosing the, choosing the growth option actually is choosing to change your environment, choosing to change things. The most simplest example is if you have lots of, if you want to lose weight, don't keep lots of stack all around your apartment. If I have like Starburst everywhere, you know, it's going to be harder for me to choose the growth option when I'm really craving sugar. This uh, idea of choosing growth, it's, we're not trying to say it's just always easy, right? To just choose the growth option, but there are things we can do in our lives to make that option easier for us to choose. Okay. Well, thank you, you both for explaining that. And now I'm going to start going through your book. So Going back to the sailboat analogy, there's this concept of anchoring, and I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Ben Hardy's work, but I really enjoyed his book, The Gap and the Gain. And in it, he talks about how unsuccessful people are living in the gap because they're measuring themselves against this ideal, whereas the people who are living in the gain, which is they're measuring themselves against their previous selves are more successful. And I wanted to use that metaphor to understand what are some techniques for how we can anchor ourselves. Yeah. So well, that's a very interesting question. So anchor ourselves in the sense that we have an awareness of who we used to be. We have an awareness of where we want to go. We also have an awareness of the present moment. My gosh, if you can, if you can have all sorts of those kinds of awareness, that's what meditation can help you with big time. I don't know if you're a meditation guy, John. I, I am. That's are. why I wanted to have Dr. Vago on the podcast because he's uh, one of the experts on it. Oh, well, do you want me to make an intro or? Oh, he's sorry. already been on. He's already oh, been, he on. Dave, been on. Dave is Good. great. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. I love his work. There's a lot of overhyped claims about mindfulness that Dave writes about in his work. He, he wrote a scientific paper called Mind the, the Hype. I believe it was the title, but I think that some real great aspects of mindfulness, even not just mindfulness meditation practice, like where you sit in a cushion, but we're talking about just mindfulness in your daily life, like Ellen Wanger, old school psychological mindfulness before uh, the whole new mindfulness craze came into science to talk about the meditation, but actually how can you have mindfulness in your interactions with people? And either a very, very high level of transcendence, as Maslow talks about, you're able to see the, I hope I don't start getting too woo-woo here, but you start to see the eternal in the everyday. Uh, you have this amazing simultaneous awareness in every moment. Uh, even I would say Susan Cain, my friend Susan Cain, bittersweetness, right? It's like you can really enjoy a moment, but also be aware that that moment won't last forever. And also be aware that in a sense, that kind of moment in the sense of humanity will last forever, even after beyond you. There'll be someone else just like you having a moment just like this with someone else who's just like the person you're talking to. <laughs> you know, these things recreate themselves generation after generation. There's going to be a Scott Barrett, someone who looks like me <laughs> in the next generation doing podcasts and talking about human potential. I hope they they watch this podcast 100 years from now, by the way. And, there and is only one Scott Barry Kaufman. <laughs> there is only one. Well, that's very kind of you to say, Jordan. There's just something beautiful in the awareness of like, this oneness. I say that in the spirit of connecting with humanity, not just the humanity in our current generation, but connecting with the future generations that have never even come about and, and connecting with past generations and all the hard work people have done. And, you know, and then just feeling part of just you know, the more we can kind of feel part of humanity, I think the more connected we are to each other. Yeah. So I'm going to go to the human connection piece here in a second, but I wanted to ask one more follow on question to anchoring. And one of the things I will highlight to the listeners is that throughout the book, you guys have a ton of techniques that you outlay for how people can overcome certain things. And I know one of the biggest things we all deal with is fear. So I was hoping, Jordan, that you might be able to tackle some of the techniques for the listener of how they can overcome that fear in their lives. There are so many different types of fears. There are psychological fears, which we talk about in the book, fear of failure, fear of losing control, fear of rejection. Then there are things like phobias, these hardwired and sort of ancient evolutionary fears of things that could kill us, like heights and spiders. And we don't talk as much about the specific phobias, but we use techniques that we actually use in the field of psychiatry and psychology to help 
treat things like specific phobias, like exposure therapy, to help people overcome everyday psychological fears. We first have people think about a fear that they have overcome in the past and really hold this and mindfully keep it in their mind's eye. What is something we've all likely faced a fear, whether it's far in the past in childhood or more recently, perhaps during the COVID pandemic, which is really an anchor of the book. And what was that fear? Imagining, having the reader imagine how they overcame it. What internal resources did they utilize? What strengths? What external resources? What other human beings? Did they seek someone out for help? And then we have them really bring to mind a fear that they are currently engaging in. It could be something that's really top of mind. We don't want everyone, all the readers, we really encourage them to be mindful of their own psychological safety. And we don't want people making decisions that are actually unsafe for them physically or, or harmful, and they don't necessarily have the support to process what they're going through. So we want folks to choose a fear that gives them the right dose of sort of adrenaline and fear without being too overwhelming to, to tackle. And we have them think about really imagining themselves, doing a mental rehearsal, dipping their toes in the water of facing this fear, thinking about who they might recruit to help them, what resources that they use to face a past fear that they might use. And we have them really meditate on this before they actually go do it. And then we have folks go out and try it and then reflect on it and iterate. We don't expect everyone's gonna go face their fear the first time they try, but perhaps they can little by little get out of their comfort zone, just like we would gradually expose someone to thinking about a spider and then seeing a video of a spider and then touching a spider little by little so we can increase the tolerance to the thing that we are afraid of. Can I guess, yes, end that? Fear is, there's a term in psychology called experiential avoidance. We know that's one of the top things that keeps perpetuating a cycle of a mental unwellness. I don't, I don't like the phrase mental illness, <laughs> but mental unwellness. We do so many things in our lives to avoid the thing. There's actually a study that just came out. I just tweeted it out five minutes before this conversation we had just now showing the huge analysis of a meta-analysis, which is a very, very large analysis of all the studies that have ever been done on trigger warnings. And the research found that trigger warnings have absolutely no effect on your learning of the material or even on the emotions that you feel when you encounter something that you want to avoid. This research is consistent with this broader idea that, that if you have fear for things, the more you avoid those things, the stronger you build it up in your head, the more that you create this fantasy, this idea that you are a fragile human being that just can't handle life on its own terms, and then it starts generalizing. Look, I say this for someone who, for a large part of my life, uh, suffered from generalized anxiety disorder. I don't know if I've ever admitted that in my entire life on a podcast, but someone who experienced that for many, many years, I even when I was in Philadelphia, sometimes it was like hard for me to even just like leave my apartment because I was so afraid of also high sensitivity. So lots of noises and things bothered me. My first book on Gifted came out. My first book for that people cared about <laughs> the books before then that were academic books. But yeah, on Gifted came out. I had to suddenly go on planes and give talks, give keynote talks and things. And I was just like, I'm not going to let all the fears that I've had in my life prevent me from living the life I want to lead. And I think that's what it comes down to at the end of the day, right? That's what we'd write about. self so actually, are you making choices that are prevent, really preventing you from living the kind of life you want to lead, be the kind of person you want to be? I, I started off with some Xanax on some of those plane rides, but eventually weed myself off. And just the more exposure I got, the more I confident I felt that I could handle the life on its own terms. And now I have supreme confidence in the world. <laughs> I'm not joking, <laughs> but, but I've come a long way. I I think that's so important to mention, and I just have one final point on this. When it comes to fear, avoidance reinforces our fear. I think that's such an important bottom line, that when we continue to avoid or move away from the things that we think we are afraid of or we think may be bad for us, it makes them so much larger. And like you said, it generalizes. So one question I always like to ask my patients when they're talking about fears or they're getting to something they're avoiding are, are you moving away from something or are you being drawn towards something? When we think about passion and living the life we want to lead and moving our sailboat in the direction of growth, it's really about finding this balance of what are we avoiding? What are we trying to move away from? And possibly replacing that with something, what are we moving toward? And what is calling us? That is just one way I see growth supplanting fear. 
Oh, Jordan, I love that. I guess we got to give John a chance to talk. <laughs> but, uh, but I feel like Jordan and I are having this conversation here. <laughs> it's like, oh, I love that. That is in line with the ACT approach, the ACT approach, right? It was on my podcast. Well, multiple times we're, we're friends. He always emphasizes the importance of realigning your consciousness to your values in moments where you feel like you're straying away. Like, let's say you want to... You know, it's like, oh, I want to hit, go to the refrigerator and eat that chocolate that I know that's in the refrigerator. And then be like, oh, wait, wait, values or long-term vision of myself is not as someone who is just sitting there uh, all day long eating chocolate on the couch, right? There's a greater purpose for me. <laughs> so being able to align your values constantly is it can override sometimes um, your fears and it can also override poor choices in your life. Well, I want to jump into your chapter two. And for the listeners who tune in every week, we've been talking about the grant study in a couple of the episodes lately, which was this mega study that went on for 75, 80 years. I think it's still going on where they analyzed the lives of people over that time period. And regardless of wealth, not having wealth, the one thing that they found brought people happiness was human connection. And I wanted to ask this question Giving that as a backdrop, why is it so important for us to move from small talk to big talk and how do we do it? Yeah, I love this practice. I did this with a group of medical students when I was teaching my positive medicine class during the pandemic. And we were all on Zoom. We really were craving deep connection and realizing it's really hard to get past small talk. We're not even good at small talk anymore. We're not used to seeing people and, and being behind these screens. And we wanted to get a way to get folks bonded and just get to the heart of who everyone was and really create a space where we're not just talking about where we're from or what we're studying, but deep questions of what makes you tick? What are you thinking about? What's on your mind? So we have this whole practice that is aimed at helping folks create deeper, richer connections we call that big talk, but we also want people to practice small talk as well, because all of us are probably a little rusty on that. There's a study I, from many years ago, I the Aaron and Aaron study. When was that from, Scott? The 90s? The 96. Uh, 96, okay. Uh, I'm just going to make that up. 1997, <clears throat> very close. Yeah. Yes. So Arthur Aaron and his wife and their team of researchers had actually brought folks into a lab to study different types of connection. So they had people do a small talk exercise and get to know each other. And then they had them do a deeper talk and, and they gave them the questions to use. And they found that those who were in the deep talk connection had much more robust connections with the stranger that they were paired with when they went through these questions. So I think in this era where it is hard to connect with people just in general, that we wanted to give people a way of getting deeper. And I feel like I'm not saying this very eloquently. So Scott, feel, feel free to jump in, but we want to <laughs> help people get to know each other and be vulnerable and move past just the weather outside conversation, but really create deeper sustaining connections so that people can create a lifelong relationship with someone or find common ground. And it's these deep connections that, that bring so much richness to life. Yeah, I was wondering, are, are there people that really enjoy small talk? Do, do we all kind of hate it? I think there are people who enjoy it. My father mm. is, uh, he, it's, he, he's a big schmoozer, a big schmoozer. schmoozer. Yes. Okay. There's a word for it even. Yes, that's true. That's true. Okay. No, yeah, I was just wondering, but I think a lot of people that are talking to each other, a lot of instances where they would rather not be having the small talk. And if they could have some sort of methodology to be able to have some bigger talk, I think they would probably enjoy their uh, interactions a lot more. Well, I would agree. I mean, the question I hate more than anyone is, what do you do? Because it's this defining question and you do so many different things. So now I just answer it that I'm a storyteller and then let it go from there. <laughs> I wanted to touch on chapter five, which was one of my favorite chapters, not only in this book, but also in Transcend. And Scott, in the book Transcend, you discuss this light versus dark triad. Can you explain what that is? And can you also touch on the core components of be love? I'll start off with 
the notion of B-Love, because that actually was an impetus for going into that whole research program in the first place. Maslow had this idea of love, that we can have love for the being of others. It can transcend even to feelings of liking someone, right? You might not even like someone, and yet you still have love for their being and for their uh, you know, a deep respect that they're a separate entity for you. And, and not only that, but you can watch another human being unfold in their own way without having to control them. There's a certain beauty to that. Um, even if you don't particularly, it's not how you would act, you can still appreciate or respect that that's how someone else is acting. If there's a very famous Carl Rogers quote, Carl Rogers is another humanistic psychologist, which is when you look at a beautiful sunset, you don't think, oh, if only I could move the left hand side a little bit to the right and change the hue a little bit. You just enjoy the sunset. And the humans can be just as beautiful as sunsets if you let them be. So, okay, so all that to say, that that's the notion of be love. And then there had existed a whole psychological literature on the dark triad for over a decade. For actually 20 years in the field of psychology, there's been such a disproportionate focus in personality psychology on the dark side of humans. That's like narcissism, that's psychopathy, Machiavellianism, people who are always like strat strat scheming. (laughs) You know people like that every second. They're thinking, how can I get more podcast views? How can I uh, do do this? How can I exploit that person? I was exasperated with this. I went to the Positive Psychology Center, went to my, we already mentioned David Yaden. I went to his office and I was frustrated. And I said, is there anything interesting about people who aren't because it seems like that's all that people care about. If you look at Netflix, all the documentaries, like the Tinder Swindler, you know, that's, that's all people care about? Really? And if he was just joking, he, he wrote me an email and said, white triad, question mark. And I, being me, was like, David, I know you're probably joking, but why don't we start a whole new research program? <laughs> I guess that was my own Mac exploitative drive there. Well, I see an op- I'm opportunistic sometimes, right? I was like, why don't we create a whole new program and see if there's something that exists uh, along those lines? And um, we conducted so many studies and so many participants. We're still ongoing conducting this with all around the world. We're coming up with a map of the light triad by country by country, state by state. <laughs> the light triad comprises three components. One is having a basic uh, respected dignity for each individual, uh, having a faith in humanity that uh, humans are perfect, but there is a basic goodness to humans. Treat people as not means to an end, but treating people as ends to themselves, which uh, we in a really nerdily fashion dubbed Kantianism which is the mirror image of Machiavellianism. <laughs> because here, here we go, nerds, because Kant's first categorical imperative in his philosophy is treat people as ends to themselves. Don't use people. Don't use people. That was his moral imperative. And Machiavelli was the exact opposite in his writings and prints and stuff like that. Does that make, make any sense? It makes sense. And in chapter seven, you have one of my favorite quotes by Seneca about intentionality. And it says, if one does not know to which port one is sailing, no wind is favorable. And I use this daily mantra every day where I say, let go of the destructive habit of breaking the commitments that you make to yourself. And then I say the Mark Twain saying, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things that you do do. So throughout the bow line, sail away from the safe harbor, et cetera, which is all about your sailboat metaphor. So Jordan, how can we cultivate and nurture our inherent capacity for exploration, which is so important for understanding with this intentionality where we need to take our lives? Another very big question. You mentioned the need for exploration. We just talked about love and you brought up chapter seven, which is all about purpose. Now we're talking about the sail. We're talking about the part of our sailboat that propels us forward into the world, helps us engage, helps us really understand the horizons, understand our potentials, really live rather than just exist. We've alluded to this already in this conversation that one of the paths forward for doing that is really to understand our values and what are the horizons that we're moving toward as opposed to avoiding or moving away from. And When Scott and I, we always ask our students at the beginning of classes, what are your deepest held values? I find it perplexing how many people have never thought about the answer to that question and have never really sat down with that and say, hmm, what are my values? The first thing is trying to understand what our values are, understand 
how we are or are not living by them right now and thinking about ways to deliberately start integrating those values into our day to day. I think one of the amazing things about this podcast and the reason we wrote this book is because just knowing something isn't sufficient to actually enacting it into our lives and to doing it. So thinking about our values and that tied into values are also passion and purpose and really understanding why do I wake up in the morning? How do I actually craft the hours that I'm spending in a day to be oriented towards these things? Bringing them into our awareness and then figuring out how we can move the needle and not just giving up when we fail because we will fail because life is so busy and there are so many demands on our time and people are going to ask us to do things and we're going to say yes, then we have to learn how to set boundaries so that we can live by our values. But this is a constantly evolving constantly negotiation with how we can live by our values more more authentically and more deeply and being aware that values can change over the course of our lives and over the course of time i didn't want to end this interview without talking about chapter eight where you go into how we become transcenders and scott i'll direct this to you what is maslow's theory z because most of the listeners probably have never heard about this before, and how do we live more in the B realm? Mm. There's a famous sort of workplace theory of theory X and theory Y is just that if you're a manager and you want to motivate your workers by theory X, it's carrot stick, extrinsic rewards, and that's how you motivate them. Theory Y is the way to motivate them is by intrinsic passion. Um, But Maslow said, let's go even further, folks. What about a theory Z? What about people who are motivated by transcendence? <laughs> they're, they're motivated by peak experiences, by flow experiences, by values that transcend being itself. I never quite put it that way, but actually that makes a lot of sense. Values that transcend being. Wow, that, actually, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I never know what's going to come out of my mouth. Things like justice, truth, beauty. Right. These are things that lie outside of ourselves just as much as they lie within ourselves. In fact, Maslow said that we get to a certain point of transcendence where we can transcend the geographical limitations of ourselves. So it's not that we have completely self-sacrificed ourselves. No, that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is that our self is in the world so much that there's really very little division between self and world. What is automatically good for us is automatically good for the world. And and that's really that encapsulates, um, I think, that whole chapter. What do you think, Jordan? Yeah, I totally agree. And one of the ways that we operationalize transcendence is dichotomy transcendence, not seeing the world in this black and white version of itself that's so easy to fall subject to. We're so polarized, thinking about all of the binaries that exist among us, but really embracing all of the the nuance, ambivalence, shades of gray and honoring the totality of what we experience, even when certain values or certain emotions or certain experiences may seem to even conflict with one another. How do we hold that and honor and uplift even those contradictions? Okay, and I always like to ask authors this question, and I would like you both to answer it. If there was one thing that you would want a reader to take away from the book, what would it be? My answer is really almost like self-evident with, and it's just really that one can choose growth. People don't even realize that <laughs> they get caught in their loops, right? They get caught every day. Like there's a lot of learned helplessness. And a lot of this, by the way, I mean, we're influenced by Martin Seligman's uh, seminal work on learned helplessness and then how he went to learn hel- hopefulness which is where that's where his work is at right now, as well as uh, our friend uh, Dan Tomasulo. I wrote an awesome book, which I wrote the forward to, <laughs> called Learned Hopefulness. We want to instill a lot of learned hopefulness in people that if they're in their life of learned helplessness, and then I think that process is choosing the growth option. And I think my takeaway is twofold. One, we can't do it alone, that we have to invite and include other people on the growth experience with us because we're not solitary beings, we are deeply interdependent and the needs for both connection and love as distinct needs very much both include other people. And that it's a journey, growth is a journey without a destination. There is no definitive place we land when we say we're done. All right, I've grown sufficiently, it's time to stop. 
but that it's a constant commitment and recommitment. And sometimes we have to take many steps back in order to reorient and, and get to the place where we're going. And I wanted to end with one philosophical question and either one of you can take it. Not sure if you guys know Ari Wallach. He teaches at Columbia as well. He has this new book called Long Path and in it, he believes we need to focus ourselves on a purpose that is greater than ourselves that impacts our future ancestors and their ancestors. And do you think that's true when we're choosing growth, that it needs to be bigger than ourselves? Not always. Sometimes the smallest, seemingly selfish choice is the growth option that we need in our life at that time. I don't take a hard line stance on that, that everything we must be choosing in our life has to serve some grandiose uh, life purpose. So it's amazing how these micro moments of growth over time add up and mul will multiply into huge transformations that impact the world automatically because you become a transcender. But I'd love to hear Jordan's answer to that. I think it's a yes and. I think change starts from within. And for some people, that personal self-oriented motivation is going to be what gets them on this path. And then I think what ultimately will sustain the path is realizing the good for others and something that is larger than ourselves. I would say, I do believe that is ultimately true, that the best way, the best way we may grow as ourselves is to focus on others. And that is also how we sustain the growth option. Okay. Well, for the listeners, I just want to tell you, I've just covered an extremely small aspect of their book. There is so much incredible content in here. And on these podcasts, I don't like to give out too much because we want you to buy the book. So if you read this, you're going to become immersed into how do you become and is it even possible to become fully aware? You'll learn things from William James and Carl Jung. You'll learn about existential gratitude. You'll learn about imposter syndrome. You'll learn about perfectionism all these different things and ways to tackle all of it so it can guide you on this growth path. So I just wanted to say what an honor it was to have you both on this podcast. Congratulations so much on this book, which has, I know, been years in the making. And I think this collaboration between the two of you is amazing. So thank you, Jordan and Scott, for being here. Thank you for having thank us so you much. Thank so much for having us, John, and for all thank, that you do. Yeah, thank you for kicking up off the whole book tour. <laughs> Thank you. You, you. you kicked us off. Well, I'm so happy I was, was able to do it. So thank you guys for being here. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Scott and Jordan. What a pleasure that was to help them launch their brand new book. I wanted to thank Jordan, Scott, Alyssa Adler, and Penguin Random House for the honor of having them both on this podcast. Links to all things Jordan and Scott will be in the show notes at passionstruck.com. Please use our website links if you buy any of the books from the guests who are featured on the podcast. It helps to support the show and make it free for our listeners. If you prefer to watch this in addition to listening to it, check out our YouTube channel at John R. Miles, where we have over 400 videos today. Please go there and subscribe. Advertiser deals and discount codes are in one convenient place at passionstruck.com. Dot com slash deals. I am at John R. Miles, both on Instagram and Twitter, and you can also find me on LinkedIn. And if you want to know how I find incredible guests like Scott and Jordan, it's because of my network. Go out there and build yours before you need it. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview I did with Dan Dapani, who is a Hindu priest, entrepreneur, and former monk of 10 years. Dan Dapani is a sought after, internationally acclaimed speaker and leading expert on leveraging the human mind and the power of focus to create a life of purpose and joy. And we discuss his brand new book, The Unwavering Power of Focus. Focus needs to go hand in hand with purpose. I talk about leading a purpose-focused life. And people talk about being intentional with our lives, right? Lead an intentional life. It's like, okay, how would you lead an intentional life if you don't even know what you want? The fee for this show is that you share it with friends or family members when you find something that's interesting or meaningful to you. If you know someone who's really into self-actualization and personal growth, definitely go ahead and share today's episode with them. The greatest compliment that you can give us is to share this show with those that you care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, live life passion struck.